Welcome. Okay, the awkward 10 minutes to set it up, right? So let's see. And even that works. Okay, we can start. <laughs> Thanks. So we okay, have a couple of things were said already. So um, hi, my name is Thomas. I'm going to talk to you about a process that we call working back from the customer. And I need a little bit of like kind of ramp up to get there. Uh, because I'm not sure who of you worked in Amazon before and knows what we are doing and how we are doing it. So Thomas, software development manager uh, in a development center in Berlin. Um, in that development center, we do different things like robotics, uh, Amazon Web Services, retail stuff, machine learning, a lot of machine learning. And I lead a kind of typical two pizza size box teams. And I will talk about what that means in a second, uh, just as a comment. There's no Unicode character for a full pizza. It's only a slice. I don't get why. But there's one for kebab I learned yesterday. So my team is increasing kind of the front end developers and designers' productivity and happiness, and we're building tools and processes around that. So that talk about is about the fact, like, or the problem, how to share and work on ideas together, right? Or how to align and create a shared understanding and vision in projects or in the startup you're doing. And I start with something everybody here probably has seen in some sort or some form or another, then go through what Amazon is doing and why this company is like that, and then go back on what we do actually. So bear with me a little bit. So da -da -da, it's a user story. Uh, user stories are a short, simple description of a feature told from the perspective of a customer who desires a new capability. And there's a lot of additions to that very kind of plain, simple format. And there's user story mapping. I think there was a talk about that earlier today. I sadly couldn't attend. And there's also even a great Twitter account, if you don't know that one. Uh, it's user stories from goats and what they want. It's really funny. And the idea, like the key behind a user story, from my perspective, is like, I'm not a smart person. Somebody said that. But like, uh, read that. My perspective, the idea is that you get into a situation where your developers and your designers and your team, you're talking about something. So you're not just like kind of throwing a description over the fans and the developers go, I'm going to do that. If I don't know what to do, I just fill it in with what I've seen before on the internet or what I think is right. But you actually can ask these questions and spec it out and, and, and define like kind of details. So I made up a random example. It's not super exciting, but imagine there would be a backup software we're all building, and I kind of put that in and say, kind of, hey, as a power user, I want to specify files and folders to exclude so that the backup storage is used efficiently. That might work, like kind of reading that, about that, talking a little bit, like kind of, what did you mean, Thomas? Did you mean like the mobile app or on the web? Where does this feature need to be? Right, kind of, that will work. Like it's, it's small enough. It, like kind of, we, I think we can create a shared understanding pretty quickly. But other random example in similar space, like if I want to express a bigger idea and say, kind of, as a photographer, I want to back up my photos so that they are safe. Right? That's a crap user story, like for many reasons. But also, it is, it is, there's a larger idea probably here that you want to discuss, but does it even make sense to discuss that? Like, do we have a similar enough idea already? Um, does it make sense to go to a meeting and waste hours of expensive dev and whatever time to start walking that through? Um, Right, like kind of what I've been talking about. Like cameras have now wireless on the camera directly from there to like a million questions here. So, and that's my personal opinion. Like kind of, I don't think that user stories work for something that's bigger than a like kind of nicely scoped problem. They work really well for that, but they're not the right tool for everything. And the size of a well-defined problem is limited by the complexity achievable in a single sentence. I know that a lot of here are, as I am, German native. So we know Thomas Mann from school, and we know that he was able to write sentences over multiple pages. Um, but that's not helping either, just like a hacking a sentence, because in German language, you can do that and make it infinite. Um, and also, don't get me wrong, there's like kind of very, very powerful sentences, right? Like kind of the example I have made, like it's random and it's crap and can prove that. But there's really, really powerful sentences, but also, also these powerful sentences, they, they just maybe capture an idea and a vision, but they're not 
good enough to start working. That's one of my favorite, actually, two sentences that I think are fundamental and important, and like Vienna is one of the locations of the United Nations. I think it's amazing sentences, super, super important sentences, but could somebody do something just because of that? Probably not. So it's not the sentence as a concept, it's, it's really the, the, the problem space and the method. So how do you do that? Yeah. How to align teams and big projects to create shared understanding and vision? Um, we have mechanisms to do that. So like kind of our company is a lot around mechanisms. And our company is a lot of different things as well. So a little bit back to Amazon. So I talked about the two pizza box size teams. It's a very American kind of phrase. It is kind of we have a lot of language that's specific to our company as every bigger company has. So two pizza box size teams is the idea that if you have two large American pizzas and you have a lunch break and you can't feed your team, your team is probably too big. Right? There's obviously exceptions and probably one of them. But the idea is that like kind of you want to have a simple idea, kind of communicate to the, to the organization, say that kind of, hey, your team is probably too big. Uh, you probably want to split up, right? And you can split up teams by all kinds of like dimensions. You can say, okay, let's, we had cross of course, small cross-functional team before, let's split it by function. Let's split it by region. Let's split it by um, kind of service, right? Like, so many, many ways to split, depending on your organization. The one makes more sense than the other, and probably it changes, right? Like if you go again, I split differently. Uh, to give a little bit perspective on how large the company actually is. So when I joined in 2012, I checked on Wikipedia before, like kind of, and I said 100,000 employees, and I was like, wow. That's a lot. <laughs> Let's see what I do there. And um, then I checked this morning in the last, kind of last statement we, we published, we are now 351,000 employees. And for me, it's still as fast because we are in these small teams working on the problem that we want to fix. And that is pretty similar to kind of if you remember the, the talk from ID software, like have a small focused team and just do it. Right? So that's one part of the problem. These small teams, they can pick their technologies, they can pick their processes, and you just build it and run it. And that makes like kind of a big part of what Amazon is, is, is that structure for me, but it's also the fact that you work backwards from the customer, the customer wants kind of wants something and you build it. And then we are long-term oriented, we like, have built something, we try it out for a long time before just say, didn't work. And in my part of the company where I'm working in Amazon Web Services, uh, what we have done here is we launched 1,017 new services or, complete, or kind of larger features in the last year. Does it render? Kind of. Um, so that means that's 2.8 a day on average, every day, where some team in our organization just shipped something that added customer value, and it might have been a full service. So how does it work? You have the two pizza teams, they're nimble and fast, right? But how does that go completely insane? Right? Similar to the ID talk, we have guiding rules defined. And ours are also public. Uh, so we have Amazon uh, leadership principles, 14 of them. They evolve and change over time. And they don't focus on just the programming part as the ID, like kind of development principles or software principles, or pro programming principles, they were called. They deal with how do you want to run and work in this company. And the very first one is customer obsession. And the very first sentence in the very first one is, leaders start with the customer and work backwards. So that little process we have is even codified in our very, very first sentence of our very first principle. So like kind of, that's good. Like kind of, we want that as a company. How do we do it? Right? Good intention will not be enough. Reminding everybody in my team, like kind of, hey, think about the customer, will not work. So you need mechanisms, right? You have your uh, Git hook, so before pushing, you can run your tests, right? Like there's a mechanism. That's what I'm talking about, mechanism. I want to install something in the company that is used every day to ensure that we do what we want to do. And for us, in that working backwards process, one thing that we have is this process about how do we do all of that? Um, how do we ensure that, that mechanism, right? And it sounds really silly at first. And it took, honestly, it took, like me, took, took me a year, one and a half to get behind that, but now I'm actually an advocate in, in the company for that process. 
It's, you start any project that is of significant size with a press release. You write a press release, and you say, like, hey, this is what we want to do in the press release. And you work backwards from that. A press release is usually what you do last, right? You have worked for it two years or whatever we do, like how long it takes, and then finally you're done, and you kind of ask your PR person or you write it yourself in your startups, like, kind of, hey, blog post, press release, da da, there we are. Right? We start with that, and that's why it's called working backwards. I kind of obviously can't share press releases that are work in progress. Um, so I went to our like, communications site and scraped a couple of ones that are actually press releases that we kind of gave out after releases of our products. The thing here is they're obviously not one-to-one -one what we have used internally to get there, right? There's certain like kind of language changes and structural changes in a press release if, we, if it's actually used as a press release, right? That's why it was a mock release before. But it's very similar. So there's a couple of sections. Right? There's a heading, kind of introducing to you to what is going on, and a subheading that describes the market segment, like who should use that. So it obviously, like intro, rough idea, what is it? And it's very much to the point. And then it goes on with a summary. Don't read all of that. It doesn't make sense. But the summary basically says when, right? When do we do that? Um, what is the key, right? Kind of this is the thing that you send to your, um, your superiors, uh, to your like kind of VPs and, 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 and high level folks, to your investor, right? Like whatever it is. And say, so, okay, this is the gist, like right? it's a one paragraph about what this is what we have launched. And then it goes into the problem definition. So you have, hey, this is the current state, and this is why we should do something about it. Following up with the solution, what have we done? So you find all, like, if you're making pictures of that, you find all of that online. That's not a secret. Like, the, the press releases are all online. Um, then the solution, so how do we address this problem? And then you usually see a quote by Amazon. So, like, that's a real person. Like, all of these, if you see them, they're not made up. Kind of saying why we should do that in the voice to, like, customer. What you will usually see followed up then is how to get started, describing how easy it would be, it'd be to use it. Then you have a quote by a customer saying how awesome it was to use it. And that also is real customers uh, in this press release on release date. So we're working with our customers to get there. And then you have a closing call to action saying, hey, where is it? Is it free? What does it cost? How to start? And you have that not just for like kind of software products. You have that for movies, for anything else this company is doing. So it's a standardized process that everybody in the company knows. Right? And I, like kind of last year, I had a thing where I thought, hey, there's something kind of wrong with global facilities. They should do something different here. So I started writing a mock press release, very rough sketch. I sent that over to like, VP facilities. Never met that person, no idea. Right? But they understand we, we, we have a shared language here because that is an established thing in our company. So he was like, ah, oh, thanks, Thomas, for that idea. I will merge it into what we're going to do next. Cool. So. Woody Allen, if you would be excited about Woody Allen, you're like, oh my god, that's cool. And then, like, kind of, what is it about? Quote by Amazon, how to get started. Same, same fragments appearing. And just yesterday, I found that one, so it looks like we do a documentary. Um, so, again, a movie, um, like, who's doing it? The summary, quote by Amazon, call to action. That's, again, a technical one, heading. We say, hey, Avis launches Amazon Athena, so what is it in one sentence? Like a paragraph of like, a more detailed description when it's going to happen. Again, problem, solution, quote by Amazon, quote by the customer, closing call to action. So, and if you read a couple of these, what you will see is that there is some sort of pattern that's probably not by accident. So we try to have this as a structure because it helps us think about our problem very thoroughly. If you ever try that, you will realize it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard to write that because it makes you think. Like if making a PowerPoint and just like kind of bullshit all the way over it and like, oh, fine, invest the money. That probably works, but it will not work long term. 
because you have to think your problem through and you have to write it up. And if you write it up in detail, you will realize that there's a lot of gaps. So step one, writing the press release, how do we work backwards from that? Ah, next, sorry. First, details about or tips for writing a press release. Take your time and nail it. I just said that. It takes a long time to write it. But if you have done anything like kind of automotive industry, so I have been an engineer before, a mechanical engineer, um, you will know that anything you can do in the beginning of a process will be, um, by orders of magnitude, cheaper if you want to change th something. So even if it's tedious to write this up, and it takes a long time, it will be so much cheaper than halfway through the project. And ignore all constraints, right? You're probably sketching something that is like three months, six months, a year, two years, five years out. So don't be restricted by technology, right? Don't, restrict it, don't be restricted by the people you don't have or have. All of that doesn't matter because you try to pitch an idea, right? You want to make, see if that works. So just ignore the constraints. Don't bother with them. Describe the, the final state and then see how to get rid of the constraints. And especially important, if you're not excited reading this document you have written, after you've written it, just don't do the project. It's probably not good. Um, so, but kind of that one page instead of the user story obviously will not get us far enough. So there is a process around that that continues. So what you will do is you send this around to your peers and like kind of managers, uh, somebody else in the company you think they might be related uh, to your topic or the domain you want to solve, and they will give you like kind of tons of questions around this. And these question will, questions will add me to the skeleton that you have created. And you will group these questions in like FAQs. So you have customer questions, probably, and stakeholder questions, depending on your project. Right? You might be able to split in different sections. And questions I would probably always ask is, from a customer's perspective, what's going to excite me about that? What might disappoint me? Right? It's very honest questions where we expect to write honest answers. Because if you don't write honest answers, you, you're just lying to yourself and your, your coworkers. Right? You, you want to like kind of spec all of that out and then discuss if that part that is disappointing me, is that a deal breaker or not? Should we change them to something around this? So it gets more and more specific with every step you take here. How do I find that? What happens if I'm in Austria? Can I actually use this? Um, other questions from a stakeholder's perspective would probably be, why is this important right now? Right? Because we have seen many cases in our industry where like, there was like, tablets and phones before the iPhone, but it was not the right time, obviously. Right? So why, why is now the right time? How do you actually know that you were successful? What does success mean for this project? It can be very different things. Uh, what's going to provoke the most debate? Like if you do that, like kind of which other team will like, maybe not like it? or? Is this something that is super costly, something you have to change as a process? Like, what, what is it that probably kind of will be a little bit icky? I say a potential for fraud and risk. Right? It's a very important question to ask, because in the end, you're building something your customers should trust you doing it. So what is that setup? And then if you iterate over these questions, you probably go back to your original press release and refine it again. And then you continue along the way and you start, start with the mockups, right? And then you sketch the customer experience, you keep the fidelity, you should keep the fidelity as low as possible as, as possible again, the current state uh, of your project is, right? Like kind of if, you, if you're further along with the project, your, your uh, mockups are probably a little bit more hi-fi. Just keep it as simple as possible. Um, because if you would show me something where you have a half-baked press release, a couple of questions, not answers, but like fancy, a fancy user interface, you probably have wasted time, right? Because I will find things that you haven't thought of that we could have found beforehand. So like kind of going hi-fi was too premature. And then basically tell the story of how a customer would use your product to achieve that problem. And then you're basically done, right? No, you're not. So <laughs> obviously, like kind of, it is a kind of, it's a working document. That's the whole idea around this. So you would loop. You keep this alive, and you change it throughout the project. Ideally, most of the things you have written don't change a lot. I've written stuff recent, like kind of not recently. I've written PRs in 2014 that launch now, and they're accurate. I'm 
fought like hell about that. And I needed to do little changes, so it was expensive at first, but the whole process, the whole project was super smooth afterwards because we reiterated, we thought a lot about that beforehand. So, recap. The idea that we have and that we have as a mechanism for running projects in Amazon is we start with a mock press release describing the idea in a customer-centric language. We add FAQs to kind of unpack assumptions and anticipate additional needs like resourcing, things we have to invent that's not invented yet or solve that's not solved yet. And we'd have mock-ups to, to describe what's going to happen and how this feels like. If you want to know more about that, either find me somewhere or uh, you can also Google for uh, working backwards and Werner Vogel, Vogels, he is our CTO and he has written a blog post around that in 2006 even, which again, just describes the steps and the idea uh, behind this process. And that's it.